I want to get into this, this incredible uh, story, but first, uh, how did you come to a career in comedy? Like, what uh, what started you out? Um, I was uh, dating a lady. It was my first ever girlfriend, and she was 17 years older than I was, and I was trying to be the the basketball dreamer, playing college basketball in Seattle, and she said, what if you don't make it? And I'd never had any doubt that I wouldn't before until she said that, and so uh, we got into a big fight. She goes, what are you going to do? It scared me, so I thought, okay, I'll hang up uh, basketball shoes. And I just went to the open mic in Seattle, the Comedy Underground, and I just signed up, and I went on, and I just tore it up. And they invited me to the Seattle Comedy Competition auditions the next night. And I said, I'll never do anything again. So that was it. I've never had a job, Shad. I just like, this is it. All in. Caught the bug, and you were— That was it. That was it. What what subjects were you touching on in your early work? Um, I remember doing, like— uh, I had to, I would walk and then I just think of something. Like I saw this movie uh, Betrayed with Tom Berenger and Deborah Winger, and uh, there was one ridiculous scene about a, a neo Nazi clan in in uh, northern Idaho, and they got some black dude and took him in the woods. I came up with some funny spoof off of that, but I remember even even early then I wanted to end on some sort of philosophical high note. And so I would say some of the stupid stuff about, you know, the stuff that I talked with. And then I ended with, and just remember, if you only get to go around once, try to have as much fun as possible. Thank you. Good night. And I thought that was going to be my big hook, was to say that kind of <laughs> philosophical, stupid stuff. <laughs> so uh, let, let's get into this big, fateful moment that happened for you professionally and personally. Everything changed for you uh, in one moment. There was a bar brawl. Uh, you almost completely lost your eyesight. Situate us. What year was that 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 took place? That was uh, 94. I just went through a rough divorce in L.A. And I just uh, had one week of work in Surrey, uh, B.C. And then I, it was uh, when the Canucks and the Leafs played in the, in the Western Conference Finals. And the Canucks beat the Leafs. And then uh, my wife, uh, ex-wife got into a big fight on the phone. So I went out with some of my Canadian buddies and we went to this little goofy bar. And I was upset with her. And then this guy with the Leafs t-shirt was upset because I tried to steal a cab, his place in line at the cab stand. And I started, you know, chirping. And then he just, he didn't know the rules of engagement. And he just hit me in the face when I was talking trash. And that's just against all brother, you know, violations. You you got to give me at least 15 minutes to talk trash before any punches are being thrown. And he hit me in the eye, uh, and it got me pretty good. And he detached the retina, uh, and I could tell something was wrong, but I didn't go to the doctor for a while because I was afraid of diagnosis. And I didn't want to go to work. I mean, I didn't want to lose any work. Yeah. Yeah, and so I just let it go. And then and then uh, I was going to do being interviewed by a local CBC television show, and I was afraid if I went to the doctor, they would tell me something was going go wrong so I said no I'll just I'll just risk it and your eyesight was already compromised at that point I was right? already born really really nearsighted mm-hmm. bad eyes so you, then, you're, you're kind of scared of this diagnosis mm-hmm. um, what was it like going into your surgery and this is a risky surgery this was a very risky surgery that I needed to have so the guy that hit me he detached right in my left eye my right eye uh, began to get cataracts and I got some corneal abrasions and stuff and so Nobody in New York wanted to do the surgery because it was risky, being the only eye that I had, and it was in severe, weak condition. But I trusted uh, the team back in Vancouver, uh, hmm. and I found a fantastic Dr. Law, Francis Law and everybody. He, keeps, he just said, listen, I can do this, but it's going to be a, a high risk. Uh, and I just thought, I, I believe this guy could do it because I believe that he could do it. And so I, I read that you turned down general anesthetic. For the no, surgery? No, I didn't turn it down. Uh, he just put freezing drops in, but I had to be awake for the procedure. So he was wow. had to needle and thread uh, this implant into my eye, and so I was wide awake, and, and it, it started to hurt. The freezing uh, element just uh, just was hurting, but he had to do it. And then uh, at one point he goes, listen, this is just going to hurt, and I'm sorry. And that may be kind of relax and deal with the pain because hmm. if you think about life, how many times – could things have been better? People would just say that to you. This is just going to hurt, and I'm sorry. And that just, it really... It's true. It, it yeah. applies very much outside of the hospital, doesn't Absolutely, it? Absolutely, yeah. What was that moment like when the surgery was over? Um, I was so afraid going in because I thought, you know, uh, my life has just been so hard, and so much of it was self-inflicted, but I didn't think I could continue to fight if I was totally blind. And so I was really nervous and I had these, you know, seriously con- contemplated suicidal thoughts. And then when he finished, uh, it was almost like I went in shock because my whole body was cold from the pain. And then uh, he just was done in a fast second. Like, okay. And then I sat up 
And then I look down and I can see my shoelaces, like the lines in my shoelaces. And before that, I mean, I could barely see my hand in front of my face. Uh, and I wanted to cry, but um, my eye was just hurting and I was, you know, I didn't want to do any damage. And then he came in and it was, it was just incredible. Pivotal moment and, and you mined that whole experience for comedy, uh, including those darkest periods uh, that you mentioned where you contemplated suicide uh, yeah. beforehand. Here's a bit from your 2012 Blind Ambition special. I want to play this. So I start having these serious suicidal thoughts in my head. And this is how I know God has a sense of humor. In the middle of surgery, I heard the voice go, would you really kill yourself if you was totally blind? I said, yep. I heard that same voice go, how? You'd be totally blind. <laughs> and I hadn't thought that far. Right? Tell me, how did, how did comedy help you through that funk? Um... Uh, God, I just get emotional every time I hear that that wow. night at the Vogue. Um, it was um, I knew uh, I knew that I have to get on stage to talk everything's out and uh, talk everything out. Like uh, I don't see well on stage anyway because of the bright lights, and so it's you know I don't want to sound cliche like it's therapy, but you know I trust my ability to stand on stage and stage and organize my thoughts. It's like working with your eyes closed, and so. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to put that pressure on a friend to say, listen, this is what I'm afraid of talking about. So you do it to strangers. And a lot of times strangers are way more receptive to what you have to say than, you know, family and friends and stuff. And so hmm. uh, I just was able to talk about it. And, and I mean, Vancouver and Canada in general, they just trust me so much on stage. They just let me be patient and work my way through stuff. And that's, that's what happened. It's why I love this place so much. Hmm. Uh, amazing night for you that must have been, performing that special at the Vogue uh, 2012. And you kind of let it all ride on that show, didn't you? You financed that yourself? Yep. Yep. I bet it all. Um, yeah, yeah, because I knew I had something. I mean, I knew I was pretty good at what I did before then. I got, you know, a few good things, some just for laughs and all the good things was that, but I wanted more. The ambition part was more. Uh, and I wanted to, I wanted. Like my wife bet on me so big, and uh, and the country Canada bet on me so big, and that when I left, you know, I felt like I had to do something, uh, and so when I got these surgeries done, and I knew I had this chunk of material, uh, and people reacted to it so strongly. I thought, okay, well, I'm not gonna wait for Comedy Central, or I'm not gonna wait for the Letterman people. I'm just gonna do this, and it was because Doctor Law, when he was in my eye, hurting me like that with the needle and thread. Uh, he made me realize that how could I even possibly think about checking out or quitting when he couldn't quit? Like he had to keep hurting me until he got the job done. And so I thought, well, man, if that guy's willing to go that deep, how deep am I willing to go? Hmm. So I bet everything that I had and, 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 and then to come out on stage at the Vogue and everybody stood up. And then when I finished, I mean, I just, it was crazy. I still get like, whew. Do, do you remember what it was like being done and walking off the stage? I remember walking off real slow and uh, Tracy Rideout, Laugh Out Loud producer, she's like my, gosh, she's like my my thing. I love her. But she was <laughs> producing and uh, she set up these candles and everything and I was walking off uh, and, and then I wanted some tequila so bad, Chad. <laughs> I was like, I gotta go get drunk. It's too much for me to process. And I was just numb throughout the whole process until the next day, and I was uh, on Skype with my mother-in-law in Ottawa, and she was asking how the show was. And then uh, my father-in-law was with me and, and my wife, Claire, and he said, Daryl got a stand innovation. And, this, and then it hit me that I did it. And then Claire and I went back to the room, and I just broke down. And I wow. cried so hard because I, it felt like uh, I knew I had done something special, but I also knew that I had exercised so many demons uh, in that one thing, one take so much money and only had one shot to get it right and i knew in my gut that i had hit it that's so. unbelievable i mean not just as you said not just professionally but personally <sighs> huge it was something uh really quickly i want to go back and, and ask you about your relationship to canada uh because you first came to uh, vancouver was around 1994 right what was it like to uh, start over in comedy uh in, Va in vancouver in canada it was it was brutal uh, there's a quiet mercilessness that Canadian audiences possess when they don't think you're funny. It's just a, it's just a menacing quiet. 
And I used to do this bit about uh, Dan Quayle. He used to be a monster bit in the States. It was Dan Quayle was so dumb. All his speeches were like I see Sam books and, and, and stuff. And they just stared me down and... And I was doing, you know. Yeah, the Dan Quayle material doesn't hit doesn't quite fly, so much here. It didn't yeah. fly so well in Prince Rupert, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, so I had, you know, what happened, what had to happen was I bombed so best so many times. And then what I ended up doing a Northern BC tour. And I remember just walking around the neighborhood in Telqua, British Columbia. And I realized, I said, what the hell am I doing with my life? And I started looking around. And then I saw how everything was different. And I just got on stage and started talking about my life in that moment and it was like a switch went off and so, that changed everything so what kind of jokes do canadians appreciate then did you discover uh intimate they're just naturally intimate but you know because mm. you have the british influence on your your sense of humor and then you have the american influence, and you have your own canadian and so you have a it's like a little booyah bays of all those things but they like intimate and cbc is a big part because these great storytellers and so you learn how to tell a story with a lot of nuance and and funny intimate stuff and they're just patient so that's right in my wheelhouse it is exactly your style of, yeah. of comedy uh although this this special has taken you to new heights in canada as well as in the states uh last question for you daryl what kind of risks uh can we expect going forward what what do you hope to do going forward um you know i've i want to you know, get this television show going. Brent Button and I have a production deal. It's my television show, Lennox 2020. And so having that guy on the team is unbelievable. And we'll pitch it in the U.S. And we've got some good bites going on. And we'll do it here. Uh, I want to see how good I can be. Looking forward to all of it, Daryl. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Shad.